Good afternoon. I'm Emily Len, Rangeland Management Specialist with the Prineville BLM. Good afternoon. I'm Larry Ashton, Wildlife Biologist with the Prineville BLM. We appreciate you joining us today for a presentation on the Playa Restoration Project we've been doing here on the district over the last decade. The project started with an initial idea to inventory the playas and dugouts in the high desert. A review of the literature showed a need for more data for playas in the ecosystem. We started spending several years documenting species from invertebrates to birds to bats, studying water depth and conducting ecological site inventories. We looked at livestock use and spent time with permittees trying to find ways to meet operators' needs while managing for the greater sage grouse. We knew our sage grouse numbers had been declining due to a variety of causes, and it was important to know more about the habitat as a way to figure out how we could make improvements. All of this information led to the idea of restoring some playas by filling in some of the sites that had been historically converted to dugouts. Playas are low-lying areas on the landscape that accumulate snow melt and runoff from surrounding uplands, causing them to experience seasonal ponding. The ponding occurs because of a dense clay layer that helps prevent permeation. Playas located in Central Oregon High Desert have the potential to provide important habitat for an assortment of plant and wildlife species in a hot, dry environment. Ponded water is critical to the survival of many plant species, and some plants can only grow in or around these seasonal wetlands. Although these seasonally ponded depressions in the Central Oregon High Desert do not fit the Great Basin definition of a playa since they support a diverse plant community and are not saline, they are, however, located in a semi-arid region and are dry, undrained basins that infrequently contain water, which more closely aligns with the National Soil Survey definition. Since the definition most accurately represents local field observations on the Primeville District BLM, we use the term playa throughout this project. Playas are important early and late broodering habitat for sage grouse. These habitat features provide a diversity of plants and insects. Due to the inability of juveniles not being able to process sagebrush leaves in their diet, hens focus their broods on areas with insects and a diversity of plants that have milky sap, tender leaves, or legumes. Because playas usually hold more moisture, these mesic areas are typically highly productive sites that can be used for longer periods of time throughout the yearly life cycle of a sage grouse. You'll hear a lot of these terms for these features, words like water holes, dugouts, dirt tanks, and you'll find them throughout the high desert here on the district. We're standing here at two post water hole dugouts. So a lot of, you'll see a lot of these dugouts sprinkled throughout the desert. And it's really, it's been a project associated with the BLM since the 1950s and 60s. And a lot of them were cooperatively done with the range per permittees at those times where they would recognize uh, natural ponding sites such as, um, as the playa feature, the dry lake beds. And they would dig them out with heavy equipment to retain water longer for livestock water. In order to graze, they had to get creative. What changed for the operators is, you know, in efficiency across the landscape. It, it helped distribute the cows um, in areas throughout the pasture. So you didn't have a ton of livestock concentration sites. You spread out the use throughout the pasture. And the, the dugouts or the dirt tanks were just less expensive than installing a, a well site. So there were a lot of efficiency focused things um, when these were first getting established. So Larry, how do these, when you come up across a water hole, what do you think about from a wildlife biologist standpoint? So from my standpoint, the water holes do provide some water uh, for you know big game species and just a variety of species in general. But like you're saying, the water isn't as reliable and it will dry out sooner. But looking across the landscape, the dugouts shrink the water footprint. And this is already a limited habitat for species like sage grouse who rely on these features for hens rearing their broods. 
When the water is spread out across the landscape, it provides a bigger footprint for the forbs and their um, tender leaves and their legumes and their um, highly, the protein packed pollen and the petals and flowers of the forbs. It, it just shrinks the footprint and provides less area for them to grow in a suitable manner. So when you shrink the footprint, um, you need more resilient species to grow. So you lose your diversity across the landscape and that just impacts sage grouse. This project really got going in 2007 when we started to get data on what we had out there. We, we began an intensive playa inventory that conducted some level of inventory on 103 playas on the district. Conditions varied each year, making the evaluations difficult, but we tried to identify plant species at each playa and collected information on everything from invertebrates to bats to birds. We were even able to start collecting seeds from the intact playas. One of the most critical components of this project is understanding the water. That is, how does a pool, how does it behave in relation to the soil? And the biggest question really is, can the clay layer or the restrictive layer be restored? We began monitoring to confirm the playas in the project area were epi-saturated, meaning that they're saturated from above, from snow melt, for example, rather than from below, from groundwater. We wanted this data so we could quantify the extent and duration of ponding and the duration of soil saturation as well. Really what we wanted to get at was how long do we have free water on the surface of the playa. To understand this and to better inform our results, we installed water table monitoring equipment and these sensors were placed in both the natural and the dug out playas. All of this data we used to feed into an environmental assessment that was completed in 2013 and 14. But before we could fill in the playas, we had the, to complete the complicated process of installing the wells that would provide an alternate water source for our livestock. We added two wells, and that was just the beginning. Since we scaled down in size, we chose two dugouts that were historically wet later and longer, providing the habitat we needed. We even saw sage grouse on the days we were filling the dugouts in. We waited a full two to three years to ensure the well systems were working properly before filling in the dugouts, all the while communicating with the permittee. The following transition shows the process of filling in Dog Lake. We had planned to fill it in in 2018, and it turns out 2018 was an exceptionally good year for moisture. We had a technician out for two weeks pumping the five feet of water out of the dugout prior to filling it in. Then we started to fill it in. It took five days to complete the project. Since we were going to modify the water, we needed to involve the permittee. We weren't sure at first if we were going to be able to sell the project. It was a big ask. Here's an idea, and we're not sure it's going to work. But in the end, there's going to be some reliable water in the desert for you. It was a leap of faith. What did you first think when we came to you guys as permittees and BLM to start this playa project? Honestly, I was a little concerned because anytime you take uh, a couple good water sources away, uh, it's always concerning. Uh, but when the BLM proposed the, the well drilling, uh, that is a, a better than a dugout because you have the water year after year. Uh, so, you know, go. Going back, I was skeptical at first, but uh, the way things that have progressed over the past few years, it's, it, it's a really a good deal. Once the dugouts were filled in, we started to seed them. We put down 350 pounds of native forb and grass seed across 15 acres total. A lot of seed came from across the region and a playa located a few miles away. We've gone through seeding twice. Um, we seed in the winter or late fall, primarily trying to get it before a uh, moisture event. And we used the native seed mix of native grasses and forbs. And then we even were able to collect forbs from a, um, a natural playa, an untouched playa through the Seeds of Success program. And thanks to that, we were able to use locally sourced forbs and grasses 
and we were added, able to add it to the seed mix. So three years out, we had some challenges. After the first year, we had the year of the mustard, and we were initially disappointed. But with some targeted grazing, the cows helped take out the mustard, and with more seeding, we're finally seeing forbs and grasses. Now we're seeing native species like crepus, yarrow, and Idaho fescue. It's probably gonna take a few years and a few cycles of seeding. Um, we're gonna have to request funds for seeding each year, and essentially just trying to build up the seed bank. It's tough to grow stuff in the desert, as you can see. Uh, it's really moisture dependent. And just like how Emily was talking about the annual variation in water year to year, it's a roll of the dice with, is your seeding gonna be successful? All right, so this is Dog Lake. Um, this was one of the first areas we decided to fill in for a dugout. So it was an existing dugout um, that at times could hold up to five feet of water. And I had seen it both completely dry years and then completely full. So it was a very um, cyclic playa before we dozed it in. And actually the year we did, uh, it was a five foot depth of water in the center of the dugout. So we actually had to pump water out, out into the sagebrush to be able to bulldoze this in to begin our restoration project. Whenever you try something new, you always learn a lot. From the get-go, this project was tough to gain traction. We had to really reinforce how we were meeting the BLM's multiple use mission, since we're not research driven. I'd say getting the funding and authority was one of the biggest administrative hurdles. Then we had the physical challenges. Where do you hide a 20 foot tank in the desert? We had to work closely with our partners and line officers and communicate often. We had to think about how filling a dugout might affect more than just livestock. We didn't want any unintended consequences. We had to take a leap of faith. Growing anything in the desert is tough. We're in this for the long haul. Restoration will take time and repeated efforts, but the benefits will be much more valuable to the wildlife and to the ecosystem than the simple price tag of this project. If we were to do this again, I would suggest that we wait until a drier year to fill in the dugout. There were some concerns of the bulldozer getting stuck when they were filling the playa back in, um, which led to some little rills and gullies, but it's still mostly flat, but I would wait till a drier year. So that way you can get it just flat as a natural playa. What would you say some of the challenges were when we were discussing like how to implement this or locations of well sites and stuff? I would say the main challenges were, you know, I had run cows up here for close to, I don't know, seven or eight years leading into that. And just, you know, not knowing what the cows were gonna do uh, is always different because they have their same routine. We had, bring in, had been bringing the same bunch of cows up here for, for years and, you know, not knowing what that was going to bring and, and what troubles were going to arise. But, uh, it, you know, there hasn't been many, if any, that I can think of. It's, it's, been, uh, it's been good to work with you guys. And, uh, you know, the problems that we have discussed as far as, uh, you know, we, we're worried about cows getting in the dugouts after they were full maybe bogging down and then we put the fences around them and uh, put them up at the right time and we took them down at the right time so or, or they're still up but they will be taken down at the right time so right. yeah we've kind of just you know through just discussions over the years we've kind of just evolved with what's going to work best right we've tried a lot of things out here you know different different aspects of the project and try to just have you guys right at the table each time. So I think I think that's been a key, at least from my my view, a key of the success out here. I think the main key of, of our success and with Larry and is just communication. Sure. You know, you guys when you have an idea, you, you guys talk to us. And when we have an idea, you know, we talk to you or, you know, just always letting you know what's going on and what we see on the ground. And I think that's the main uh, the main thing with this whole project is it was it was communication from the very beginning. So after a few more uh, seeding years, we're going to plan on removing the fences around here um, 
and just continue to monitor. I think that's the biggest thing is that we can learn from what we've done and what we need to do if we want to try this on other playas and hopefully just see a, a robust response in the vegetation and the natural ponding cycles. We've learned that one round of seeding isn't enough. So we'll be doing seeding, putting in for more funding requests, and probably doing some more seeding. Additionally, this is only one aspect of the project. The EA addressed multiple threats to playas, including rerouting some roads that bisect them. There's been so much more to this project than we were able to share today. We've worked in more areas, conducted tribal consultation, put up fences to manage the livestock in the area, installed flight diverters, cut juniper, and so much more. It's taken a lot of specialists to work on this project. We value everyone's help all the more because long-term projects are hard to maintain due to turnover and changing priorities. This is truly a legacy project for the Prineville District.